Orrin and Tal, thank you so much um, for taking the time to be part of our webinar series. Um, a little bio about uh, Orrin and Tal. They're both the heads of the Alexander team at Douglas Elman Real Estate. They've been recognized um, for their sales achievements this year. They're the number one uh, broker for Douglas Elman in Manhattan, the Hamptons, and South Florida. And recently, as of today, um, they are the number one brokers uh, for sales in Dade County. So congratulations both to you, Orrin, and Tal. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Hot Living, for having us. Um, thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak, as well as giving us an opportunity to put on some suits after a couple of weeks. So. Feels good. <laughs> Hope you guys and your family are safe. Thank you. Um, as I said, is uh, let's just kind of go into the um, the questions that we discussed. Tell us, have you ever been uh, through anything like this before? Tell us what you guys, what's going on. Well, we started our business in um, ultimately the about summer of 2009, and that was arguably D-Day of the recession in New York City. So we started our business in that moment, and I think this time it feels a little different. Uh, it doesn't feel the same as the financial crisis because it's a global pandemic. We're all in this together. And I do feel while things have slowed down um, and rightfully so to really try to um, flatten that curve, we feel that business will be back. The markets will be back. The economy will be back. So um, we actually think this is an interesting time and it's creating a real opportunity uh, as there will be uh, deals out there. And this moment of clarity ultimately during quarantine has given us uh, an opportunity to really reflect and strategize and, and start to uh, think ultimately about our future. Our days uh, B, BC, as we like to refer, uh, or excuse me, before Corona, as we like to refer to it, our days were very fast paced. We're all, always on the go. We're always, you know, uh, working, making deals and having this opportunity to really reflect and strategize and plan our future has been um, somewhat good for our overall business. And what has quarantine been like uh, for the Alexander team? I mean, I follow your Instagram. You guys are fishing. You're making good time out of it. So tell us what you guys have been doing, um, as you said, to be productive during quarantine. Yeah, so the new norm for us right now is um, we're hanging out here, all, all us brothers. We're in Miami Beach at our house, just taking it easy. Uh, we do have a nice little routine. We like to get up in the morning, wake up, work out, um, get on the phones, get to work, uh, checking with our clients. Um, and then we get like another activity in, in the afternoon, uh, some biking of some sort, just a little walk, jog outside. Um, and then we like to prepare dinner together at the house, which has always been nice. Um, so it's been quiet times around here. Um, it's been a few weeks for us. Um, you know, just a month ago, we were in New York with our friend, Alex Sapir, the developer of Arte. Uh, Warren was hosting some events in New York to the New York City brokerage. Of course, we had the LEs and the award ceremony, um, but once the mandates came in and about uh, pretty much the lockdown, we decided to come and, and do our quarantine in Miami. Yeah, we've actually been making um, the most out of it as we feel it's really important to, at this point, uh, touch base with our clients, you know, check in on them. Uh, we've made it a point also to give back. Uh, Tall's been spearheading helping feeding a lot of the uh, healthcare workers in the local hospitals. Uh, we're all trying to do our part and ultimately, hopefully we'll all be out of this together very soon. So, so tell us, cause you specialize obviously in New York, Hamptons and Miami, what's going on in those three markets? Are they all the same? Is there different, different pockets of, of clients? What, what, what are your clients saying or what's, what's your thoughts? So I'll start with Miami. Um, local hospitals, uh, we're all. So regarding Miami, you know, day one of quarantine, it was really important for us to help our clients that were looking to um, move and find new places to be during the quarantine. So Tall was focused on the Hampton market. He was helping our clients relocate. We did about seven leases to uh, clients that were relocating for the quarantine. In Miami, we did about five leases of clients looking to relocate. From there, we managed to you know, work on deals that we had 
pending that were in contract. Uh, we saw, uh, obviously, it shifted a lot of the dynamics. In Miami last month, we managed to close um, four sales in over $30 million, which we're very happy to be able to, to get them done during this period of time. Um, the Miami market, actually, I don't think it has gone down, at least not for the single family homes. I think what we're seeing now is a shift in dynamic of, of what people and what their focus and their needs are when, when purchasing a home. So to give you some examples of that, in just this last month, uh, the month of March, there was two sales uh, down in the Gables Estates area, which were for north of $40 million uh, that went under contract, which is obviously we all know Gables Estates, uh, where you have huge lots, acres, uh, as well as you know, a lot of water frontage, so that neighborhood in general, the last couple of years has been quite stagnant. There hasn't been many transactions. So to see two significant sales shows you that there's a shift going on. We also saw here in Miami Beach, uh, two significant properties on the Sunset Islands. One sold for 14 million and one's under contract for over 15 million. Uh, those are for two lots and those deals closed and went into contract just uh, you know, in the, about a week ago. Uh, north in Palm Beach, there was two major sales also last month, north of $40 million. So I think the shift we're going to be seeing and is going to continue to play out as, as I believe we have a new norm taking place. And that's going to be a, a lot of people focusing on single family homes, people that were normally sacrificing square footage to be in the best location now rather have that, that yard, rather have that extra square footage, even if it's you know, 20, 30 minutes from what they consider the heart or the, the greatest location. I'll let Paul speak a little bit about New York. Yeah, so, so New York's a little bit of a different situation. We know uh, New York City has sort of become the epic center uh, of the virus because of the density and, and the way we live. Um, but basically what's taken place over the last month is, first off, there are no showings taking place, no showings that I'm aware of. Um, I reached out to my team right when the mandate came in, let them know that there will be no showings calling off all of our sellers, letting them know what's, what's taking place, what proper protocol will be. Um, then with regards to actual deals happening, um, so over the last two weeks, the Old Sean Report, which comes out every Monday and tracks the market in real time, there have been four contracts signed over $4 million over the last two weeks. Um, but if you read the backstory on those deals, uh, those deals, those buyers actually saw the apartments physically before the crisis happened. Um, and we're sort of on the sidelines. Maybe they made a better deal because they signed the contract wall. Everything was shut down. Um, but there's very little activity at the moment. Of course, there are virtual showings things like that in place. But especially in the higher price point, I still am a big believer that these buyers will need to walk through the apartments and actually physically see the views, the light, the exposures, things like that. Um, I just want to make sure everybody understands that before the crisis, the market was up. The market was up from the end of February about 15% year over year. Um, I was seeing it in my business. Um, we had a great start to the year. Um, and, you know, until, of course, the crisis came along, things were selling. Um, and, I, and I do believe when this is done and we're allowed to get back to our normal work lives and can get back to business, that things will come back. Um, with regards to inventory, inventory is down tremendously. It's down 85% year over year. So, and that's just tracking new inventory coming to market. That's not even tracking what people are pulling off the market um, from listings that we're on. So very little new inventory coming to market um, and, not, and, and a lot of people pulling their listings. So that's what's going on in New York City in a nutshell. With regards to the Hamptons, as my brother said, uh, we were able to secure a few houses for some of our clients. Um, I've been getting some really funny requests, which we try to go above and beyond for our clients. Things like, hey, can you make sure the fridge is full when I get there? Luckily, we have some of our team members and, who have been really helpful while they've been out there. They're riding with you know, the, uh, the whole crisis and virus uh, in the Hamptons. So, uh, and I heard things are starting to pick up in the Hamptons. A few inquiries recently, people you know, taking summertime, um, thinking about maybe getting back into buying mode. Um, but right now things are pretty quiet for the most part in New York City. And I think that'll continue until uh, we're allowed to get back to work. Yeah, I think it's important to understand that ultimately since the last uh, crisis, financial crisis of 2008, there was a huge shift of urbanization of people 
that were leaving sort of the suburb areas, rural areas to move into the city, move to more densely populated locations. And those suburbs really haven't recovered um, for the last uh, 12 years. I think now given um, this ultimately a wake up call, uh, appreciation of, of, of your home, of, your ha of where you live and understanding what's important in that home you're going to see that shift. And I think you're going to see more people, especially the Hampton market, which has been down uh, ultimately the last couple of years, you'll see a big resurgence in the Hamptons as we've been seeing down here in the more suburbia areas of, of South Florida. You guys obviously have a lot of buyers and sellers that are probably asking a lot of questions. Um, what are you advising your, your sellers right now? Or what are you telling your sellers? Yeah, it's a great question because um, our job did become harder. Uh, and I say that because our job is ultimately to bridge a gap, right? We have buyers and sellers and our job is to uh, get a meeting of the minds. And that gap grew, right? Buyers are always looking for an excuse um, to offer less and to get a lower price. And obviously this creates an amazing excuse for them. And obviously sellers always think their homes are worth more. Um, and our job did get tougher. Now, what we're advising our buyers and sellers is our buyers need to understand that, as I mentioned previously, people, while sure, a lot of people have lost jobs, unfortunately, and a lot of people have lost a lot of money. Um, that's, that is true. But people also, as, as I mentioned, have founded or have gained a new understanding or appreciation for their home. So now there is this sort of rush to these prime properties where people are putting a bigger weight and willing to spend more money on their actual home. So that's kind of, in my opinion, equalized it. So I think in general, um, we'll see what happens in the next two, three months, as I think today we're like to look at everything in, in 30, 60, 90. And if you understand what's um, ultimately going to happen between the, the, the discrepancy of that gap between buyers and sellers, it's going to be up to us to really try to, to bridge that gap. And how about you tell uh, for the New York market, what are you telling? Yeah. So, you know, we signed up a few new exclusives right before the crisis came up. Um, we decided to hold back on listing those, those apartments, uh, but we've still been marking them behind the scenes from, you know, just pick up the phones, few of these buildings, we know who the brokers are that have buyers for a lot of these buildings, reaching out to them, making sure they understand about the opportunity, letting buyers that we're working with know that what's coming up, things like that. Um, so we've been holding off on any launching anything new um, with regards to buyers, which, you know, I'm speaking to a handful of them. I think a few are actually watching the segment right now. Uh, I've, I've told them, and I'll say it again, you know, it's a good opportunity now because we know we're in a crisis now. Um, and I do think that there are sellers out there and even some developers who understand that and will probably discount a little bit more because of that. But who's to say in two, three months from now that we're not back to normal and the stock market has recovered. I mean, we've had a huge rally this week. Uh, I don't know what it's at right now. But last I checked, it was up 450 points for the day. So, you know, a month, two months from now, who knows? You know, this could be somewhat behind us in the sense that we're back to work and people are feeling good about the economy. Of course, I don't think that this is the crisis is going to be completely over until we have a vaccine. And I believe that's going to take a little bit longer, but um, there's no question about it that the unknown is now. So, Oren, um, I saw last week on your Instagram you were doing a virtual showing uh, with another broker. Um, what, what are you guys doing? I mean, you guys are obviously involved uh, a lot of te with technology. What are you guys doing showing your homes or if clients do have a request? Yeah. So I was actually at that, uh, showing, I was showing a buyer who's, um, in Greenwich, Connecticut, and he's interested in, in, in purchasing a, a home down in Miami. And we were basically narrowing down, uh, a couple options so that as soon as he has the ability um, to travel and, and uh, when, we're, when we're back to sort of normal, we'll get them in there and we've narrowed it down now to two properties. Uh, for us, you know, at the Alexander team, we've been really focused on um, technology and really uh, in, in our marketing. And we've been doing that for quite some time. I know that um, 
you know, for, we've been working with lifestyle productions who are good friends of ours and uh, for over five years now and making sure that all of our listings get um, videos and, you know, for almost four years now, I've been working with virtual reality. We're shooting for our top listings in virtual reality. I think maybe Seth or Kamal, you remember me bringing my, uh, my virtual reality headset on some of those uh, Jet Smarter uh, planes that we were on and, and, I remember, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and being able to really feel the space. So for us, we've been focused on, um, on that for a long, long time. And it's really important to showcase the property. But ultimately, especially at the price points that we're dealing with, this will help the arrow down, but the client's gonna wanna walk the space, wanna feel it, touch it, sit on the couch, observe the view from there and so forth. So it definitely helps and it helps us in, in times like these more, um, but it's definitely no substitute for you know, a proper showing. And um, you spoke about um, the event you did with uh, Alex in New York, Alex Sapir. You guys represent new developments. Tell us more about the projects um, that you guys have in, that you guys are representing right now. So um, new development is a key part of our business. And it's actually something that I would say we really enjoy because we love the process. We love to be involved early and work with the architects and designers and developers in sort of curating and crafting a product. So uh, one of our first projects was the Faina House. And I started that project when I was 25 years old and that was obviously a huge success. And from there, I, I managed to also work on the pre-development and the sales of 87 Park, which is an incredible project by Renzo Piano and Terra Group, which I'm sure you've been reading about lately as they've had their closings with some significant trades. I, I believe just last week, they, uh, the lower penthouse sold for 18 million. And, we're very proud to have represented our own buyers in that project. I think we've done the most sales to date in that project. Uh, in New York, uh, we're currently, we, we, we did handle the sales for 565 Broom, which was really like a sister project to 87 Park, which also designed by Renzo Piano and developed by Beatsy Partners. Uh, we're currently in New York, we're working on uh, three incredible projects. One being uh, the Steinway, uh, 111 West 57. Uh, the Beckford, as well as uh, recently we just launched the Waldorf Astoria. Uh, and I'll let Tal speak a little bit more about those developments in New York. So yeah, with regards to the current developments in our portfolio that we're marketing, um, same sort of virtual tours that we're conducting for buyers. And, you know, it's, I always like to look at the data and, you know, looking at the Waldorf, we had our call yesterday, um, our weekly call with our sponsors and developers. And, the demand and the, from most of the buyers that we're talking to right now are coming from mainland China, which it seems like they're a few months, uh, you know, sort of ahead of us. Um, so it seems like things are opening up back up there and buyers are starting to show interest. Um, of course, we're not physically showing any of those properties right now. We will be hopefully soon, but uh, for all the buyers that are acquiring for the Waldorf virtual tours, for the Beckford, um, which we're going to be, you know, delivering the house this year, the tower the following year, and then the Steinway 111 West 57 Street, we're anticipating closings starting this summer, uh, late summer, we're gonna have our first closings. Um, so really, really excited about that as well. Um, Warren, tell me um, with financing, is it easy or hard to get uh, financing for your customers as we're hearing some of that money has been dried up? You know, I, I got to say, financing has never really been a big part of our, our business. And I say that because most of our clients, uh, high net worth and the deals that we're signing, they're always in, uh, no mortgage contingencies. And the clients usually close cash and then they'll go and refinance and they usually work with their, um, you know, whatever lender or bank that they have prior relationships with. So a lot of times, um, that could be, you know, uh, a line of uh, credit based on their stock portfolio and so forth. So it really not, hasn't been an issue for us thus far. I know their rates are as low as they've ever been before, which has made it very attractive to a lot of our clients. Um, and I think some of them have, you know, spent more or, or been um, more keen on purchasing now to take advantage of some of those lower rates. So almost if you really, and I think we're going to look back at this moment and say, this was one of the best um, perfect storms of buying opportunities that 
we might uh, ever see, just given uh, the combination of, of where some of the values and prices are, as well as where uh, interest rates are. I have a good question um, from somebody. Hospitality has taken a huge hit as a result of the coronavirus. Do you see for, or do you foresee hotels shifting revenue on selling more hotel residents? And if so, how soon will they implement this strategy? Well, I think that's been a trend that we've been seeing. Um, a lot of the hospitality brands have realized that there's a, a huge opportunity and an added stream of revenue by creating branded residents because there's a demand. People today want to have full services and amenities that are run by uh, hospitality brands that have that experience. So I think that's going to definitely, as this crisis uh, furthers, people are really going to, those hospitality brands are going to really put more of a focus on that uh, end of their business. So I do expect to see, you know, uh, a lot more of hospitality brands in, in the residential space. I mean, you know, the, if you look back the history of branded residents, it, it really started in New York City. Um, I really credit uh, related and the Time Warner and um, you know, Susan DeFranca, who had the opportunity to work on that project, which was the Time Warner, the Mandarin residences. That was truly the first branded residence. Um, and then from there, Mandarin did the one Hyde Park in London. Um, and then since then, we've seen Four Seasons really get into the space and really almost dominate the space. And we're very excited now to see Mandarin coming back. Our, our good friend, Michael Schwo is working on some incredible Mandarin residences uh, here in, in, in uh, the U.S. So um, I think that trend is going to continue. I think people today are, are, you know, they want the least amount of headaches and they want the most amount of services. So branded residence is, is definitely the way to go. Um, another question is you just listed a $37 million unit. Uh, what is the action to take when you're, you have that listing now and what difference are you doing in this marketing approach um, from all uh, Marzonko? Thank you. So, yeah, we just listed um, a, a penthouse at the Faina house for 37 million. And uh, this was a, a deal that we, you know, we um, were working on prior to the crisis and we had a choice to make, you know, whether we wanted to launch it, um, today or we wanted to wait and hold back till this blows over. But we felt very confident that one, there's a lot of buyers today that are spending more time online. They're spending more time on social media. So we felt this was a great opportunity to garner a lot of exposure, a lot of digital exposure. So we've created, you know, as you've seen, we've created great videos on the property and we've done a lot What's mommy? Don't, don't, don't touch the garbage. Of, uh, don't, don't touch that. that. Don't touch that. Are we okay? Are we clear that? Yeah, I think it's um... okay. So yeah, we, we made it a choice to launch it now during the during this uh, period because we felt we would actually get a lot of exposure digitally, and um, we also felt that there's a lot of buyers out there around the world that you know realize that hey, wherever they're quarantined, then maybe they would have rather been quarantined. You know, down here in, in, uh, so they're doing on the this beach. one or in the blue one? And I think everyone can agree the weather the last 30 days has been uh, remarkable. So we felt it was actually a good time to launch a listing. And so far, we've gotten a lot of traction. We've been yielding a lot of interest. And we're excited for the opportunity to get some of those buyers in the door. All right, great. Um, also, Another question is um, from uh, Dina Korsmozokova. She said, there's no doubt a lot of business that went online in the last uh, month, including real estate. When can we see more live open house events sharing with the client agent information about the property online? What in your opinion can stay online in the new future of real estate um, to help increase the velocity of deals and the reachability as uh, Tal, you said you were speaking to clients in regards to the Waldorf in China. So just to, to talk about um, the digital uh, aspect of the business and, and what's here to stay. Um, a lot of these, again, a lot of these initiatives we have been doing for quite some time, again, with the video production, the virtual reality. I think now a lot of um, the sort of consumers have been turned on to it. 
And I do believe a lot of that will be here to stay. As I mentioned before, I don't believe it's a substitute. I still feel that this might help people narrow down their search. Um, but at the same time, at these price points, buyers are going to walk away. Not going to be able. They're not going to want to do everything digitally. Um, I mean, there are certain cases we've had that experience of where we've actually managed to do deals completely uh, remote. A lot of times, just using FaceTime. But in in general, I think we're all uh, looking forward to that opportunity to really, you know, see a buyer face to face, walk them through the space, really have them um, feel it and touch it, and, and so forth. Okay. Yeah, just to echo what Orange said um, with regards to, to New York City, um, New York City is, is the kind of market, okay, uh, even up until before the crisis, we had a property in Soho, uh, we put on the market that I'm, I'm working on closing out as we speak for $4 million, and I'll never forget the first open house we did, there was 75, 80 people there. Uh, this apartment, by the way, is 1,200 square feet, it's a 1,000 square feet outdoor space, can you imagine 75, 80 people there? But as brokers, to us, that's a good sign. It means we priced it right. It means there's a lot of activity in the market. If I, if I finish an open house of 75, 80 people, I'm going to expect a few offers once that open house is over. Um, so I, I think that is probably something of the past. I think there'll be a lot of social um, distancing put in place. I think you know open houses will probably go into something that I've been doing for a lot of my other listings, more higher price points or by appointment only. Um, I don't think you're going to be squishing a lot of people into apartments anymore. Um, but as I want to echo what Orrin says. I don't think that in the higher price points, people are going to sign contracts and buy a residence that they haven't physically been in, been able to see it, touch it, walk around. I, I, I just don't see that happening. Orrin, you talked about uh, at 25, you represented the Fahina residences. Uh, Daniel asked a question, what advice would you give to someone that's about to start his career real estate in New York at 24 years of age? That's a great question. Um, so read as much as you can. Uh, watch webinars. And now that we have so many incredible people speaking and, and, and hot living, doing such a great job, putting together incredible panels, educate yourself because you never know when you're going to get an opportunity. For me, that opportunity came at a preseason football game. It's an amazing story because anyone uh, who's a football fan wants to know why you're even going to a preseason game, but that opportunity came and, and I, you know, I was able to talk the talk. And that's so important because you don't know where you're going to get your chance and you want to make sure when someone or when that person meets you, he knows you're the real deal. He knows that you're educated, that you know the market. And um, I think at 24, a lot of times people like to associate youth with inexperience. So you have to prove them wrong. You have to show them that you uh, have the experience, you have the knowledge. And for us, uh, I, I, I thought that being young was actually a really uh, a great opportunity because when you're 24, people are looking to help you. I would say today, I don't, I don't, you know, besides our, our friends and our family, uh, people aren't really looking to help you anymore in your, in your 30s. But when you're in your 20s, people, you know, and we do this with a, a lot of uh, young agents where we mentor them. Um, and there's a lot of people out there that you could reach out to and ask them for advice, ask them for, you know, mentorship. And I think that to me is probably the most important thing you can do at this point of your career when you're just starting. So you really got to look at this time in the market as a real opportunity. For us, we're very thankful that we started in the worst market because when you're in a bad market and that's all you know, and that's the only hand you're dealt, you figure out how to play those cards. And that's very important in, in times like this. I just want to also echo on what Owen Oren said and, and Daniel, give you my two cents, but you know, selling residential real estate is about relationships at the end of the day. It's, it's a contact sport. And what I'm seeing with our business the last few years a lot of my bigger deals that we've been successful in have been relationships that we've been working on essentially for six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. Um, and when I first met these people, sure, I, I thought I, I knew who they were, but they weren't a client. Um, they became a friend first, and then eventually they became our clients. So it's really a long game. Um, you got to invest the time. You got to understand that everybody you're coming in contact with, for the most part, is a potential client. 
whether they're a buyer, whether they're a renter, your renters will turn into buyers eventually as they get older, as they generate more income. Um, so just keep in mind, it's, it's really about the relationships and you got to stay on top of people. And the most important thing is that your relationships understand what you do and understand that you're successful at it. That way, when they're ready to make a move in the, in the residential real estate world, they're going to think about you and they're going to give you the heads up. It's impossible to stay on top of everybody and know when somebody needs to make a move. So the key is, is constantly checking in with people and cultivating as much relationships as possible. I know for my brother and I, you know, a lot of the different strategies we've put in place, you know, we look at the synergies within our business and the high end real estate world. What else are these buyers interested in? So we decided art, we would focus on the art world. We were traveling to all different shows consistently throughout the world. You know, we got into the wine world. We got into the fine automobile world, connecting even with the brokers in those worlds seeing who their customers are, who are they interfacing with. And, you know, it's one big game connected, of connected dots, as we call it. Do you, another question uh, from Malik, do you anticipate uh, some of the developers um, that they're going to struggle to sell the more pricier units? And do you see them lowering the prices or sticking to the numbers? Well, uh, it really depends, and, and, and that's a lot of has to do with product and markets and so forth. But in general, uh, we believe that, uh, you know, as a buyer, you're more likely to get a deal uh, from a developer, as especially one that's sitting on a lot of inventory. As we know, uh, inventory is usually tied to some sort of loans, of which have some sort of term, maturity dates, and so forth. And, uh, you know, those dates need to be met. And a lot of times in, in, in times like this, developers are willing to discount to increase velocity and, and ultimately to get a project finished. So it's really case by case, but in general, what we're seeing, and this is something we've seen um, you know, throughout our careers is that the real trophies, the really significant um, projects, product, you're not gonna get a significant discount. And that's because they don't merit it. Uh, we've realized and the market realizes what is a, what is a class A piece of real estate. And uh, ultimately, those types of assets, you, you know, you can't get a significant discount off of it. But in general, I think we will start to see um, bigger discounts from developers over the next couple months. I mean, obviously, what, you know, you don't have a crystal ball, but if you had to give your predictions, what, what, how do you think the remainder of 2020 is going to play out in the markets that you guys specialize in? Obviously they're different Miami, New York and Hampton. So I'll just talk on, on New York. Um, I'm predicting once this is somewhat over and we're out of the house, I, I think we're gonna have a lot of pent up demand. People need to move at the end of the day. Um, that's why people make purchases, whether they're need more space, they're downsizing, they're, they're, they're relocating, whatever the case may be, people need to move. I'm getting phone calls right now. I'm working on rentals for my clients. I've got lease expirations coming up. People need to move. There's going to be a lot of pent-up demand. Because at, the, at this point in time, I don't believe anybody is moving for the most part. Um, I do think prices will bounce back. I think if you look at the history of some of the other crises, New York City space, most recently the financial crisis in 2008. Of course, there was 9-11 even before that, which is really before my time, but spoken to enough of my peers and people in the business who did experience 9-11 and you know really the first few months was the most and best opportunity and then what happened is New York City with all that pent-up demand a few months into it you know the market really rebounded and not only did it rebound but it rebounded to even stronger than where it was previously so that's what I'm predicting you know sort of we head into the late summer months of, of 2020 and, and carrying into the fall and winter. Yeah, and, and just to touch on that in regards to Miami, I think um, unfortunate, this is a very unfortunate crisis uh, that we're all going through. But I do feel that um, South Florida uh, has the most to gain out of it. And I say that because people are putting a big value on, on their time and their home. And the lifestyle in Miami, I think we can all agree, is, is unbeatable. So I do feel the Miami market um, while I'm sure there will be uh, opportunities and, and certain deals, depending on you know case by case on, on each seller's uh, financial standings, I do feel overall the market in Miami in 
you know, as we close out 2020, we'll, we'll close out up on top. So uh, we're excited, we're ready. We have amazing, amazing um, inventory that we're excited to, you know, for this to pass and, and for us to be able to go out back to the market and then really start showing uh, some of these incredible properties. What about the Hamptons? Do you think with um, travel being different, do you think Hamptons is gonna be on fire? Yeah, so, what are you hearing from your clients? Yeah, so what's happened in the Hamptons, you know, usually people look for, you know, Memorial to Labor Day rentals, that's considered the entire season. Some people like to come in, just take a month, whether it's July, August, is always the most expensive month, it's always the busiest month. A lot of the, uh, you know, city slickers like to move out for the entire month of August. Uh, what's taking place this year is summer basically is starting now. Um, started actually a few weeks ago. So most of our clients were looking to snatch up rentals right when you know this whole thing hit uh, early March and basically secure the rental up until Labor Day. So I think you're going to see an extended summer in the Hamptons. Um, I've just been getting some phone calls this week. It's sort of just starting now. People inquiring about properties for sale. Um, I think for sure, as Orrin said, um, houses, single family houses with a front yard, backyard, pool, space, um, that's going to be high in demand right now. So especially for people coming from the city, uh, I definitely can see the Hamptons have a, a bit of a pop. So you guys are both bullish. You, you, you're you bullish on the, the remainder of 2020. Yeah, you know, we're, we're bullish on our market. Our market is very specific. You know, we deal really with some of uh, um, the best properties around the world. And we think for these um, types of assets that they're in even in more demand today. So we are bullish uh, on our market. Great. Um, and to finish it off, I have another question. Warren Ertel, can you remember any mistakes you made starting off as an agent when you got into business? And if so, how did you redeem yourself? I'll, I'll take it from the top. I mean, I think um, early on in our career, um, especially in the beginning days, you know, we really wanted every single listing we could potentially get. So I think maybe caving in, agreeing with sellers when they wanted to overprice their properties um, just for the sake of getting the listing was probably in our early stages of our career, the way we went about our business. Um, and then of course, look, if you don't price a listing right, especially you know, with, with where the market is today, I don't care how good of a broker you are, you're likely not gonna sell it. And somebody's gonna eventually come in, the seller's gonna be fed up, he's gonna want his property sold, they'll understand why he didn't have offers. It's tough to get offers on an overpriced property today. So I would say that was something, you know, we learned early on where we would get these listings and we were, you know, all high about it, but then ultimately came up short. And of course, in our business, if you don't get the deal done, you don't get paid. So now, especially, you know, even over the last few years, I think a big part of our success is being very efficient and making sure that, you know, we'll pass on listings if the seller's unrealistic um, and trying to educate sellers as best as possible so that we can price the property right and get the deal done ultimately. And then, Orrin, you were talking about reading books and, and listening to webinars. Uh, what are some of the webinars or of motivational speakers or books even you would recommend to everyone? Yeah, I think now is a great time to kind of further up your, your, your education on, on the market. Um, I, you know, for me, especially when I first started in the business, I would read all the real estate blogs, anywhere that had any sort of real estate uh, news. Uh, it's important to constantly be, be in the know and, and ultimately not just in your market because you never know when who someone might inquire and ask you about a different market. And if you do have that answer, chances are you'll get that opportunity. Uh, the webinars have been great. You know, I had a uh, chance to listen to Danny De La Vega. He was awesome. I really uh, thought he was giving great feedback um, on, the, on the market. I want to congratulate uh, them on that sale to Beckham. I'm not really sure about that price. You know, I sold a, another full floor penthouse um, in that same building. I think two floors lower for 13.8 million last month. So uh, I thought that was and that was a record, right? That was well, the yeah. First that one closed reason. and that one recorded as the record for the highest um, condo sale in um, Miami, outside of Miami Beach, of course, uh, in the last I don't know six seven years. So uh, we're proud of that sale. I'm still waiting to see what the Beckham number really closes at. Uh, that should be interesting. 
But um, yeah, I think these, these webinars are great. I really, you know, I applaud uh, Seth and Kamal and the rest of the Hot Living team for really putting these on. They're really helpful and I really enjoy them myself. Um, Douglas Elliman has done a great job putting together some town halls and webinars, uh, which have been also very insightful and helpful. So, you know, it's a great time to really take the time and educate yourself and, 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 and learn as much as you can. Uh, I also think it's a great time to, to learn a new hobby. You know, I think that's something that I've been very appreciative of, of this uh, quarantine is the ability to, to practice a new hobby. And, and, and um, that's been fun as well. So uh, I think we got to take this moment because I don't think we'll ever have this again, hopefully, where you've been sort of. Warren, like, not to interrupt you, but uh, Lewis Bergman just did a post and he said Beckham is now closed as a public record um, at 19.8 million. 19.8? I would love to see that. I would love Thanks. to see that contract, but that's a great deal. Congratulations. I knew it wasn't 24, but even 19, and uh, I would be very impressed if, if that was uh, the actual final number. So congrats on that. Um, but that's a great news. You know, I'm very happy for the activity and the transactions like those in the market. Obviously, uh, high profile people turn a lot of attention to, to the Miami market. These stories go viral and a lot of people read it and uh, we're very excited to, to have, um, you know, uh, Beckham in, in Miami. I think everyone is. And I think that's going to be a trend we're going to continue to see is um, high prof profile people when they start to pick where they want to live for the remainder of their life, so, so to speak. Uh, a lot of them are picking uh, South Florida. So we're very excited for that. And uh, we we'll continue to welcome them to, to our city. Seth, if you have any more viewers out there posing questions, you know, I know people are really... Uh for information right now um you know we can keep going whatever you like um a few more what's the best habit you do on a daily basis that's changed your business the most what's the best one habit habit uh daily habits uh what's the yeah. best daily habits that's changed your business you the most? Um, i'll tell you what's been taking up a lot of my time the last two weeks um we had a very good start to the year uh, almost 100 million dollars of contracts in new york city um, probably the best start we've ever had to a year in New York. Um, and a lot of those deals have been bigger ticket items. I don't know if you guys saw, I just closed uh, the penthouse at 252 East 57th Street for a shy under $20 million. Uh, another 20 plus million dollar deal I'm working on closing. Um, and just getting those deals across the finish line. Like I said earlier, you know, just even with the lawyers getting the closing done virtually, but even the buyers, um, there are some retrades going on in the market right now. Um, prices that were paid before the coronavirus, and then you know where the buyers going to close today, um, based on where they may believe the market's headed. So dealing with a lot of that, uh, we're definitely working not twice as hard. I think three, four times as hard. Um, and I also believe that a broker's job has become much more valuable in getting these deals done. Um, it's forget about it. If these buyers and sellers are talking to each other. There's not a chance these deals would happen. So, um, you know, I'm working a lot on just getting these deals over the finish line and closed out. And it's been taking a lot of my time the last few weeks. But the, the habit, I would say, is communication. You've got to be in constant contact with your clients. You have to, even if you don't have anything to report to a seller, send them information of, of other sales of what's happening in the market. You know, I always believe that the most important Thing you can do for your relationship with one of your sellers is just stay in touch and constantly update them. So uh, that's really important. And I think every broker should really, you know, focus on making that a habit. Uh, Cesar Estefan from Douglas Elm in Houston. He just asked, what advice do you guys have trying to pitch a super prime listing when you haven't listed in that price range yet? So um, great question. And that's something that, you know, we faced early on in our career and, my advice is don't be a hero. I'm sure the person, whoever is considered to be one of the market leaders in your market in Texas, if you approach them and you said, hey, I have this lead, why don't we go pitch this together? You'd rather get 50% of that than not have none of that. And, and we do that all the time here. And we welcome any agents you know, in South Florida, whether you're with my company or not with Douglas Elliman, and you have an opportunity, call me up you know, and I'll go pitch it with you. And we could share that listing. I think that's really important, especially uh, for some of the younger agents is like, don't be a hero. You know, it's really important to get a piece of that deal uh, versus none of that deal. 
Well, again, uh, Orrin and Tal, um, I know you guys are really busy. I, I, I appreciate both your ask. time. Oh. Tal, um, I actually want to broad, uh, highlight something because uh, earlier you mentioned that uh, in these times you guys are doing some stuff. I know, Tal, I saw on Facebook you are giving back. Um, I don't know if it's a, a personal effort or part of a national effort. If there's something you can tell us and maybe all of us on this call could uh, help you join. Uh, your efforts. My founder was very yeah, old. So Mount Sinai Hospital, it's the hospital my brothers and I were all born at. My parents are family members. It's right, it's like five minutes away from our house. Um, you know, just, just trying to do what we can. We're going to feed the nurses tomorrow. We have 125 lunches. We're going to make it a consistent basis. Around here, I'm taking tomorrow. My brothers are going to take a few days next week. I, I started a group chat with a lot of my friends uh, that are down here in Miami who wants to get involved. It's really not much um, besides the nurses who are on the front lines. Um, all these local businesses that I'm speaking to, they're all suffering big time. The ones that are still in business um, are in business because they want to feed their employees. It's not about them trying to make uh, a dollar here, trying to keep their business afloat and, and continue to feed their employees that are family probably, especially for these small businesses. So we're going to take a different small business every day and, and, and feed you know, the various hospitals, starting with Mount Sinai. So whoever wants to get involved, we gladly welcome you. Send me an email or note. I'm easy to reach. Um, and, and we're going to continue to do that until this is all over. Yeah. And another thing I want to point out, something that uh, we have access to now that um, some of these uh, immunity tests are, are readily available. It's really important that if you um, did have or you've had possible symptoms, whether it's you know, recent or months ago, it's important to get tested. Because if you do have the antibodies at this point, you are able to donate um, that blood and that blood will help sell it, save people's lives. So it's unfortunate we have some personal friends of ours that are, are struggling, that are on ventilators. And this is one of the few things you could do to, to really ultimately help save lives. So um, it's important to, to do that as well. Well, thank you on your noble efforts. Um, being able to witness your rise in growth over the past decade is uh, been nothing short of impressive and what I appreciate is you guys live life to the fullest um, from a work perspective a personal perspective uh, most importantly family and giving back um, thank you for being a great role model to everyone in the community especially at such a young age uh, seeing what you do with Benny Shabtai and other organizations uh, you guys are very low-key in a lot of the giving but I appreciate that and hope that this is a part of a platform that inspires other to give especially in these times Thank you very much uh, for taking the time and uh, opening up your advice uh, to people all along the way. So it's a true honor, um, you know, witnessing this and being able to do this. And we hope we will be doing this every day for this week and the upcoming weeks. Um, as people are working from home, we want to, you know, keep everybody connected, as we said, together uh, apart. So. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for everything you guys do in the community. And thank you for giving us this platform so our voice can be heard and, and hopefully this is helpful for a lot of the people watching. Thank, thank you guys. Great. Happy a lot of thank you. Happy Passover. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you guys. Bye.